We're going to talk about some phrases from the Gospel of Thomas that have a lot to do with your eyes, so stick around for that. Coming up on Talk Gnosis. Hi everyone, Father Tony Sylvia here. Jonathan has the night off. We are joined tonight by not one but two very special guests. We'll start in descending clerical order. We have Bishop Timothy Mansfield joining <laughs> us once again. Hello, Timothy. Welcome back. Hi, Father. How are you doing? I'm very good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I, uh, good morning. Actually, no, good, good early afternoon where I'm sitting. Yes, yeah. The time zones are weird. Uh, <laughs> and also joining us, uh, also from the Joe and I Church, Deacon John DeGilio from all the way over in Los Angeles. Hello, Deacon. Hello, everyone, and welcome from the other end of the AJC descent. I know, right? The sun never sets on the Joanite <laughs> Empire, as they say. Uh, nobody says that. I don't know why. Uh, anyway, so let's let's get let's get started before we get too crazy here. Uh, we're going to do Logia 25 through 27. The reason why I picked three of these to do today is because the first one's kind of short. So we'll see how this all goes. <laughs> 25. Jesus said, "Love your brother like your soul. Guard him like the pupil of your eye." 26, Jesus said, you see the mote in your brother's eye, but do you, not see, you do not see the beam in your own eye. When you cast the beam out of your own eye, then you will clearly see, uh, I'm sorry, you will see clearly to cast the mote from your brother's eye. 27, Jesus said, if you do not fast as regards the world, you will not find the kingdom. If you do not observe the Sabbath as a Sabbath, you will not see the Father. So there's uh, some interesting stuff there, a lot of it to do with eyes. Uh, let's start right off with the first one. Love your brother like your soul. Guard him like the pupil of your eye. Uh, anybody want to start off with some thoughts on that? Your Excellency, shall we start at the top <laughs> end of the totem pole? Go, go, John, go. What have you got? <laughs> okay, we'll start from the bottom. Well, this is actually one of my favorite um, of the Logia in the Gospel of Thomas. In fact, 25 and 26, back to back, because of the metaphor, in my opinion, it's a metaphor of the eye. And often the way that I look at these is, the way it's being discussed, obviously we have a, a solid image. So you have the pupil of your eye. We all know, for the most part, what an eyeball looks like. Um, and we tend to think in physical terms, but I think we have to remember that, you know, the gnosis isn't just for those who have, uh, you know, physical sight. Mm -hmm. There's a metaphor here, and the eye is our ability to sort of uh, penetrate, if you will, the reality, you know, penetrate through the veil um, to see the truth as it is. So, in many ways, what we're talking about here, whether it's you know, seeing flaws in your own ability to see the truth, hence the moat in your eye, or simply loving somebody um, with, you know, the same degree to which you would guard your ability to see through to the truth, um, I think is what's really coming to bear here. For Gnostics especially, this ability to pierce that veil of illusion is the ultimate, uh, you know, it's what we strive for. So in many ways, it's the penultimate thing, almost like vision for so many people. If you've been born sighted, for example, many of us can't imagine what it would be like to live without the ability to see, should mm -hmm. we lose our vision tomorrow. Yet, you know, every day we know there are people out there who do just that. Um, they don't need eyes to see, so to speak. You know, they navigate the world. Um, I think the that it's the same thing is true of the metaphor that I'm talking about here is, you know, this ability to pierce through illusion, to see the truth for what it is, that's our highest prized thing here. And to take that away from a Gnostic or any student of faith um, really causes a crisis. So I think that, hence, that's why the eye is being used, because it's something that for most of us, um, you know, we have that, as I said, that physical idea of not only what it is, but of how important it is to us. Mm -hmm. I was reminded also that when you, you, when you protect your eyes, if you, you know, somebody throws a ball at you or something, it, it's instinctual, it's, it's reflective, that you just, you put your hands up, you, and so the the act of guarding your own eye is is unconscious and it's something you just do without thinking about it and that's a very powerful image also for 
um, having, you know, s treating somebody else in that way. So I think that that's something that is uh, fruit for some meditation. Mm -hmm. For sure. I, I mean, I, John, the beautiful kickoff. <laughs> First off, like I, I wasn't ducking when I said, "Hey, you start." I just, I, I knew you'd do something awesome. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I really resonate with that because, and that's quite challenging. That that idea of the the kind of reflexive, ah, uh, you know, mm -hmm. you don't even, you don't think for a second. It's an, it's a completely automatic thing. So, what, what does it mean to? What does it mean to love our, our brother or our neighbor in that way? What does it mean to become the kind of person who reflexively mm. loves the people around us as deeply as, as we connect to it, we love or connect to or honor ourselves? Um, all of the words in this logion are problematic, and maybe we can talk about it more on the podcast. Sure, they're all, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're all embedded in complex chains of translation that you need to kind of unpack a little bit to, to fully make sense of. But right. um, I love... The perspective Cynthia Bojo brings to the the teachings of of Yeshua in Wisdom Jesus that that often we read these things often we read these things from the sort of untransformed point of view as being kind of moral injunctions to behave in a particular way mm. and when you do that and you read this one it's like oh, okay I've got to be nice to people all the time because loving people is like trying to feel um, the sentiment of affection for someone else. So I need to feel the sentiment of affection for everybody all the time. Hmm. Great. Uh, which, <laughs> behold Christianity in the 21st century, pretty much. Um, Jesus was nice. He wants us to be nice too. What was the line Gregory Singleton uh, said in that, that interview you did with him several months ago? Um, uh, be nice, don't fight is the core, uh, <laughs> the core, the core tacit belief of all, all Christian congregations. Um, that's not what this is saying. So, but, so Reverend Mother Cynthia points out that, um, or her view is that in every, every one of the preserved teachings of, of Jesus, he's, what he's doing is pointing to how the world looks from a transformed consciousness. Mm -hmm. When we've undergone transformation, when we've, when we've taken on the higher mind, when we've repented, then this is how the world looks to us. And how the world looks from that point of view is that we love our, our brother or our neighbor as deeply as we love ourselves. And we, ref we reflexively guard him or her. And that's just how it is. Mm -hmm. So don't go around trying to do it. Be, take on the kind of mind that makes that a normal thing. Yeah. All right, let's move on to 26 here uh, so, so we can have time to fit them all in. Uh, you see the moat in your brother's eye, but do you, not, you do not see the beam in your own eye. When you cast the beam out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to cast the moat from your brother's eye. I'm going to just hop in quickly and give the most obvious uh, reading of this, right? So moat, um, moat's a little obscure as a, as a word. Some people, not, you know, chip, small chip or fleck of something. So the, the comparison between moat and beam is between a tiny little thing and a really big thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I pray deeply for the well-being of anyone with a beam in their eye personally, but... Um, <laughs> <It's> a, some really <laughs> extreme piercing practices, you know. Some, it's some very, yeah. Are really into it. That's right. I yeah I don't even know where to go with that. Um, <laughs> so the ba the basic so the basic most obvious read of this and it's probably the, the sustainable one is before you start telling other people they can't see what's going on, check yourself. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's it. And I I actually apply that directly to the metaphor that I mentioned when it comes to um, Logia twenty five. You know again this whole idea of are we necessarily talking about the eye itself? No, this is to me very practical advice, especially for Gnostics, you know, where we believe that each one finds and makes his or her own path. It's, it's human nature, almost Christian nature, I hate to say that, for us to want to look at what other people are doing and say, you're doing this wrong, or you need to do something this way. And to me, this is, again, very practical advice that says, you know, before you start to play the guru to others, make sure you've got it down yourself. So I love the phrase you use there, um, your eminence, uh, is, you know, to say, um, you know, before you, uh, you know, pluck something out, check yourself. That's the phrase, check yourself, is just, it captures it. And do you ever really get there? Like, do you, uh, even every time you think that you've got that beam, right? <laughs> it's still there. There's still more to, there's still more work to do. And uh, at the end of the day, I think to me, even though this is saying, you know, like uh, you'll be able to clearly see 
uh, you know, to cast the moat. Um, it, you, you, you never quite get there. I, well, maybe some people do. Maybe Gandhi got there, but <laughs> <laughs> there's, but there's always something seems- else that you need to do before you can, you know, start criticizing somebody else. So, we, again, in a very practical sense, you know, isn't this kind of saying, you know, don't, don't worry so much about what your neighbor's doing. You know, you, you've got your own stuff to do, and, and, you know, maybe someday you'll be an enlightened master, and then you can, you know, fix the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it, it parallels all those other, you know, don't judge so you don't get judged yourself sayings that, that Jesus, you know, he who is without sin cast the first stone. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's a, just to stick with your, um, with I as metaphor, John, um, really clear metaphor for insight. Uh, and there's a, there's a common thing I think we see a lot in uh, Gnostic, esoteric, mystical you know spiritual circles just no matter what your faith tradition is that it's common that when someone else says something and you don't get it that the, the thing the thing is often to kind of decide that they, they don't understand what they're talking about where sometimes the other person has greater insight than you've got you've got a beam in your eye they've only got a moat in theirs um, sometimes the reason you don't understand somebody else is because they've got greater insight than you've got mm-hmm. so as well as um, not judging other people on their behavior or or whatever it's it's also possibly not making assumptions about as you said on the you know before acting as a guru to others part of that is 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 backing with your insights kind of adequate i guess to the situation well said all right let's move 27 on. 27 uh <laughs> this one's my favorite of the three if you do not if you do not fast as regards the world you will not find the kingdom if you do not observe the sabbath as the sabbath you will not see the father so uh, let me start off with this one. Um, being the uh, punk rock world hating dualist that I am, uh, this this one this one makes a lot of sense to me. So, uh, but it, it doesn't. It doesn't because uh, at several places, and I think we'll get into this in the podcast, uh, the specifics of it. The other parts of the Gospel of Thomas seem to actively contradict this, and this is one of those kind of beautifully interesting parts of um, scriptural tradition where you kind of get to dig in and. And, and see what's really happening below the surface. Um, fasting regards the world, it seems from a Gnostic point of view, this is a fairly standard thing, you know, like don't worry so much about the material, the spiritual is what's important, that kind of thing. Um, and then he says, if you do not, do not observe the Sabbath as the Sabbath, uh, you will not see the Father. Um, and, and for me, this kind of means Finding the time, whether it's the actual Sabbath day as has been uh, traditionally observed or your own spiritual practice or something, taking that time to really actively engage in spiritual practice um, and not just on a superficial uh, kind of a way, not just, uh, um, you know, I'm fasting, look at me, I'm so holy kind of a way. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> it's uh you're right. I mean you're right. It is it is the kind of it's got a lot of stuff in it that it's kind of useful to unpack, which I which we'll get into. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess there's two things. There's a, there's a lot of material in the Gospel of Thomas. There's several logia where there's lots of discussion around fasting, and yeah. fasting is a key concern um, in all all of the Abrahamic faiths, mm-hmm. right? So Jews, Christians, and and Muslims all fast at various times for various reasons. Lots of religious traditions do. Um, and a lot of there's a lot of key concern around this particular time because of the difference between Pharisaic Judaism, the Sadducees, you know, various other Essenes and whoever else, um, and the particular teaching of Jesus and where does he land on the very on the issue of fasting? Because this um, this issue of kind of like superficial religiosity is a big issue, mm-hmm. I guess, for people at the time. Um, so I'm <laughs> and, I'm historically contextualizing today. something, and today exactly. <laughs> Behold, 21st century Christianity. <laughs> uh, um, so in a way, he's kind of, it, it, it reads as, a little as though, you know, there, there could just as easily have been a saying before this where he's talking about, you know, genuineness in, in practice and particularly, you know, that fasting thing, we've got to be a little bit more discerning about it. For instance, Jesus said, mm-hmm. if you do not fast as regards the world, you will not find the kingdom. Mm-hmm. So it's not just about not eating certain foods. It's also, it's about like questioning your entire relationship to, to manifest existence. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, because of that, and this is so. 
sort of basic sort of Aramaic form is you get these couplets and the, and the terms in the first couplet parallel the terms in the second couplet. So the first provides a context for the second. So if you do not fast as regards the world, you will not find the kingdom. If you do not observe the Sabbath as a Sabbath, you will not see the Father. So um, presumably he's counterpointing a, a superficial um, re- religiosity Sabbath versus a true Sabbath or a real Sabbath. Yeah. And I think we'll get into some of the detail of the words that are actually being used in the podcast part, um, which I found interesting. But you, it, I, I never thought of that, and I wanted to just um, highlight the, the, the couplet aspect of it. Um, like it's something that you, you recognize and, and it has a rhythm to it when you hear it, but I never really thought about it as a literary device that gets repeated. So that's interesting. I'm going to look for those uh, going forward. Oh, it's, it's- Reading, reading anything Jesus ever says, or anything actually in um, Hebrew or Aramaic stuff, is critical. Because whenever you see a pair like that, the second one's paralleling the first one. Yeah. So you look for the... Sometimes it reverses. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they're in an A-B order in the first one, and they become a B-A order in the second one. And sometimes they're the same. Mm-hmm. But you're always getting taught something in the, in the pairing of the two. And just to back Bishop Tim up, it's I've always been of the same mind when I read this. I look at the, the wording in particular is very specific. Other places in Thomas, when we look at the way the term fasting is being used, it stands alone. In this case, we're actually seeing it, you know, fast as regards the world. Right. So we're talking about something very specific and very different here than just fasting in general. I mean, we know elsewhere in the Gospel of Thomas when the... Uh, you know when the when the apostles ask about fasting they're sort of told you know well don't do what you hate you know do right. what you, that, that whole sort of thing so i there, it's not the same kind of fasting and you know being one to never drop a good metaphor when I, when i when i read this i look at it as again being logical uh progress you know here is the cleaning of that metaphorical eye if you will you know these are the things that get in the way of you being able to see through the illusion and you know pierce the veil of reality because what we're talking about here are as you said those material attachments those are the things of the world which you you want to fast same thing with the sabbath i believe it's being used in much the same way as we said this idea of making sure you have that time to sit down for that um you know time between you and god you and the divine um whatever it may be because you've got to worry about that moat Mm-hmm. in your eye if you will and this is your chance this is how you you clean it out of there you know this is a prescription for everything that we've been talking about so far so i definitely am, am of the same mind as far as the type of fasting we're talking about here and what it means yes beautifully beautifully put deacon john i, I just just have to pull out that that very final phrase you will not see the father yes kind of round rounds off our our triplet of, of vision focused yep I'm oh, going to yeah. take credit for that and say I did that intentionally, and I picked You're those three. You're a yeah, genius. Absolutely. I've always yeah. said it, and uh, yeah. <laughs> no, go on. No, really, go on. Um, <laughs> no, we don't have time. we got to stop. I, I, there's a million things to talk about, but we will get to brilliance. those in the podcast. He's brilliant. <laughs> We're going to discuss my brilliance in detail in the podcast, and um, you should all want to stick around for that, because why wouldn't you? Anyway, so I uh, just want to give a final plug for the Joe and I Conclave coming up in May in uh, Arlington slash Boston area, Massachusetts, uh, May 12th through the 17th. So check that out, joeandheight.org slash conclave2016. You'll get to hang out with some really cool gnostic people and see kind of what the Joe and I Church does when we get together and let our hair down, such as it is. So uh, <laughs> not picking on any members of this particular panel, um, you know, but... Uh, <laughs> But there you go. Anyway, so that'll wrap it up for the video show. Stick around for the podcast. Subscribe to that if you have not. And for those of you who are watching along at home, we will see you next week. This has been a production of the Gnostic Wisdom Network. For more information about this and all of GWN's programming, please visit GnosticWisdom.net. The opinions expressed in this show do not necessarily reflect the opinions of GWN, the Apostolic Joannite Church, or any other organization. 
This has been released under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 International License and is brought to you by the generous support of our patrons. To support our programs and become a patron, please visit patreon.com slash gnostic. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash g-n-o-s-t-i-c.